reason we do uh, the executive panels is really to provide uh, some application to uh, the, the real world issues that, that all of you face on a daily basis. And the, the speakers typically come from 30,000 feet, which is fantastic and very inspirational. We really like to bring it down uh, into the trenches. So uh, please welcome, uh, help me welcome our panelists for today. First up, we have the uh, Vice President of Small and Mid-Market Solutions and Partners from Microsoft, Dennis Sarasoli. Dennis, come on out. <laughs> Welcome, sir. How are you? Doing good. Excellent, excellent. You're working the handheld mic very well. How am I doing? <laughs> Dennis will be beatboxing later. Oh, sorry, this, this crowd doesn't know what beatboxing is. Right, OK, yeah. You can, you can Google that later. Um, so Dennis, uh, how long have you been at Microsoft? Uh, Microsoft has been a great journey for me. 13 years direct with Microsoft. Before Microsoft, I owned a partner firm, and I've held a variety of roles over the time that I've been with Microsoft, from Microsoft Consulting Services, uh, business applications, partners, enterprise, global uh, customers, all sales. Oh, I great. think I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you've, you've pretty much touched every aspect of the organization from a sales Pretty close. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, welcome, and thank you for coming. Thanks. Uh, next up, we have the president of Dell Canada, Kevin Piesker. Kevin, come on out. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Now, uh, Kevin, I know um, that uh, you, you've, you've worked all over the, the, the globe. What, what role has you know, a sales hat in, in, in your career. Yeah, thanks, Ron. I'm really fortunate. Uh, by the way, it's great to be back in Canada. I'm really fortunate that I've been able to travel to over 70 countries. I've worked in five continents. And from a career perspective, I started out my career in finance, in operations, in marketing. And I've got a secret. And my secret is that when I started my career, I did fairly well academically. When I started my career, I thought I'd never be in sales. And sales was for people who maybe didn't do so well academically. And, you know, my dad was a biochemist. He was the smart one. And, you know, I just had this perception. And as my career developed over time, regardless of the country, regardless of the function or the role, I, I very quickly determined that sales was absolutely core to every aspect of the business, whether it's selling to internal customers or external customers. And so my career took a much different track. And I uh, enjoyed and relished carrying a bag, acquisition customers, large corporate customers, dealing with channel partners, vendor partners, really got into what was exciting about driving business growth. And uh, I would say that for me, sales as part of my career has been the ultimate platform for me to be now in a role where I lead a fantastic business that spans coast to coast, a well-recognized, respected brand in this country with 1,400 uh, sales and, and uh, operational people and finance people and HR people serving literally tens of thousands and, and hundreds of thousands of customers in Canada. That's I cool. love sales. I, th I, th I think the line is, uh, like porn, no one wants to be in sales. You just find yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going there, are we? All right, you guys ready? We're going to have some fun, huh? The gloves are <laughs> off! All right. But you do, you do find how enjoyable it is once you commit to the role, I think, right? You know, it's always <laughs> about closing the deep and going deeper with the customers. That's right, it? yes. You didn't tell us we are getting into that, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, our third panelist. Um, we have two, I mean, obviously Microsoft and Dell being very large global organizations, and we really wanted to balance that out with uh, kind of a sales perspective from an entrepreneurial uh, environment. So for the Vice President of Sales for Checkout 51, please welcome Christy Painting. Christy, come on oh, out. Oh, Christy. Welcome, welcome. So, Christy, first of all, I guess for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about Checkout 51? Sure, yeah. Checkout 51 is a relatively new mobile couponing app. And in its most basic form, it's a, a, a platform for consumers to save money on brands that they love. Um, you, the offers are placed, you go, you buy the product, you take a photograph of your receipt, and you claim your redemption. Now, from 
a brand perspective, we're able to collect the information on the receipt and deliver back to the brands that have uh, placed those offers great consumer insights into what else their consumers are buying and how they're behaving and, and close the loop on the, on the shopping purchase pattern. Yeah, data is really at the heart of that, right? Data is the heart of it. Data is the heart of it. Okay. Um, hey, uh, Christy's short selling herself here. I think we've got a true Canadian success story. Tell us about some of the numbers. Sure. Um, you know, we've been in Canada for about a year, and we've achieved a penetration of about 5% of all Canadian households, so more than half a million members. We launched in the States uh, at the beginning of January and have more than 300,000 uh, active members already. Um, so huge growth ahead of us. We've got a great uh, year yeah. planned. Amazing. Kevin signed up backstage. He's a customer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's Christie's converted. We have two new con converts up here. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things that uh, it hasn't come up yet may come up in the afternoon. Um, before we look at, you know, the salesperson, the sales process, what about the person you're selling to, Dennis? Like, is that, how has that person changed? I think the customer in general has changed in this day and age with social insights on digital. Um, the consumer today is a very educated buyer. And so, um, I've heard, you know, is, it, is cold calling dead? Is it still uh, alive and well? And I would tell you that uh, the consumer today, um, cold calling is not dead. It's a warm call. Um, and doing your homework and getting out ahead of the sales cycle, I think, is the key to success. So leveraging the power of the technology today, getting wrapped around the customer and surrounding power is the key to success with the sales cycle today. Yeah, that's great. Ke um, Ke Kevin, from an enterprise standpoint, is that, uh, are you finding similar situations where the, the customer has really changed? Yeah, I, I fully agree. We have a much more informed buyer, but as in all things in life, there's a continuum. And I think it's naive of us to say, hey, you know, every customer is incredibly well informed, educate, un educated, understands the totality of the offerings in the, in the marketplace. And quite frankly, if you look at companies that are on the stage here and your organizations, the depth of knowledge required within your own organizations to provide your services and products professionally to your customers is intense. Great degree of training, great degree of depth of knowledge, et cetera. Yeah. I don't think a customer truly, truly knows. And the second piece is, as we look at customers, there's a corresponding component of those customers are under pressure for so many more aspects of their business. We've all gotten leaner, we've all, all need to do more with less. And ultimately, there's a set of customers on the one end of the continuum that says, hey, I really know what I want. I've researched it. I've got it. Just give me a price. Interesting customer. The other side are those customers that maybe would have been involved in the research and buying process who are now at the other end going, hey, I've got a core business to run. This is not my area of expertise. I need someone to fundamentally assist me. And I think that's changed the landscape quite considerably. Yeah. But Christy, from a, from a consumer standpoint, um, are you feeling the, the, the pressure of that where they, it's in the couponing space, it's, just, it's too cumbersome, they just want to give it to you guys because it's easier? Um, I, I mean, I, I think we're not, really in a, we're not really in a B2C business. The, yeah. the kind of selling I do is still B2B, but on a media perspective. And, and, and I'd sort of echo what Kevin is saying. These people are really busy, and we all know that we've all become busier in the past 10 years, and th that's only increasing. So. I mean, I think the most important thing when you're selling to someone is to try to figure out really quickly what it is that's going to excite them and what they need from you. And, and maybe that's information. Some people love to get as much information as possible, and some people don't. Some people just want an answer. And if you can get them there really quickly, maybe that's the value that you're adding. And some people perhaps enjoy talking to you because you bring a sparkle to their day. And, and that's something that can't really be taught, unfortunately. Um, but it's something that you can practice, and it's a way that you can, um, it's, a, it's a way that you can really listen to what it is that they need and energize them and get them excited about your product and, and, uh, and add a little value just through the interaction that you have with them. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of you kind of talk to the, the busy factor. We, we have a line at our agency that we use that people don't want to be pitch slapped, that they're just, they're... <laughs> That's a tweetable moment right there. It's at Ron Tight. Uh, people don't want to be pitched that. But, but it's true, right? They're sick of the pitch. So, I don't know, Dennis, are you, are you finding that there's an impatience 
with sales because they've got four million things going on and you got to just kind of you know get to the goods? I'm like, fine. Do they even want to be? Do they even want to hear from you? I, they do want to hear from us, but they want to hear from a seller today that is uh, seeking to find solutions. So I think our customer today is looking for solution seekers, not really the problem makers. Um, I think it creates an opportunity for all of us as sellers to be creative in our approach to build the relationship capital, make sure that we're coming in with relevant, timely, fact-based information that will inspire uh, the customer to want to spend some time with us. Uh, walking in with a one-stop shop slide pitch yeah. uh, today um, certainly isn't going to gain the interest of the boardroom and help us shape the solutions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, like, like many of you, you, you engage with customers, and there's a ticket to entry component. And that ticket to entry component is, do you know your own stuff better than anybody else? Ticket to entry component. If you're relying, or if, if we're relying on a deck that's going to be the be all and end all, well, you know, we can put that online and customers can go through it. I had an all hands with my team yesterday across Canada and, and, uh, and I shared with them my fundamental philosophy, which I've heard directly from chief information, chief technology officers, which is, hey, if you come into my office and all you share with me is what's on your website or what I can read in the press or what I can get from the technology mags, you've added absolutely no value to my day. Thank you, don't come again. And so for us, there's an essence there of getting underneath the cover of truly understanding the customer and challenging them on what their perceptions are within their environment of what they need and providing that true value add component. Because if we don't get there, yeah, we're just slapping them upside the face and we're not adding any value at all. But with, with all the information that's available, is there a part of sales that's becoming obsolete? I mean, if, as we move into, into, a, into a lot of categories uh, as they become commodities, and I can get all the information online and I can transact online, Christy, what do I need a salesperson for? Well, I, I, think, everybody, I think everybody needs salespeople. I think we'd all agree that we're essential. I, I mean... person in the third row on the left doesn't agree. Doesn't agree? Yeah. Oh, dear. Well, we They're are from in finance. trouble then. <laughs> you know, it's I, I, I think I think the pitch deck is a bit of a trap. I mean, I think that we can get so committed to the materials that we have invested ourselves in. We've created this great deck. We know it inside out and backward. You know, we can we can do it in front of the mirror. We can do it in front of one person, in front of a hundred people. It's a trap. Nobody wants to come and listen to something that you have prepared that much. The point of selling is to engage your audience, and the only way you can engage is if you interact with them. And the only way to interact with them is to try to find out what's important to them. And you can only do that if you listen before you start to speak. So, I mean, having question selling, question-based selling, really being able to draw the, um, the speaker out, the, the customer out, and understand, okay, where are the sticky points? What are the issues? Then, when you do get into your deck, you'll be so much more comfortable in being able to pop the points that are most relevant to them. And then you can have a conversation, because then you can say, listen, you, you mentioned this. How about this? Is this going to fit together? And, and then you're actually talking to each other, not talking at each other. Because nobody likes that. That's, that's dreadful. Yeah, I, I know a story of, uh, uh, of an agency going into pitch to the CEO of a very major Canadian retailer. Uh, whose CEO does her own radio ads. Um, <laughs> she's Boy, selling real fresh. estate right now if you want, you want some. But, but they, they opened the, you know, to do a, a, the, the deck, right? They opened the deck and she got up and walked out. She was like, oh, I, this is what I'm, I'm sitting through another one of these, am I? And got up and walked. Uh, so I, I totally buy what you're, what, what you're saying. Now, what's come up a couple of times here is uh, something I know that Dan Pink, who's speaking later today, has written about. And I pull the Dan line that problem finding is more important than problem solving, which sounds great academically, but isn't that a completely different person than you've hired and you've recruited and you've trained? Isn't that a completely different approach to sales? I think the ecosystem is constantly evolving. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, it might be a different sale uh, today. 
with regard to the competencies and experiences required as we evolve through the life cycle of the sales process. Um, but it hasn't changed fundamentally in the fact that we need to understand what we're trying to solve. Uh, we need to understand how we drive the sales cycle through the organization to create value. Um, we need to go in and, and really help engineer a vision um, with our customer to make sure that we're in alignment so that uh, we have a compelling vision and, and value proposition to move to purchase. And ultimately, um, one thing has never changed, and that's controlling the sales cycle. And so, um, yes, it has become more of a consultant-like approach um, in this capacity, and Dan will get into that. But at the end of the day, we all have to have this challenger's mindset and, uh, and evolve with the times and the customer scenarios that we get into. Yeah. If I may, I'd, li sure. I'd like to merge the previous question and that question, just sure. to get really yeah, yeah. complex, is uh, I'm going to challenge, there's probably some uh, regional sales managers, some VP of sales in the audience, and if your business is a pure commodity business, that's a challenging business to be in. If it's a pure commodity business, because the value add component, there are many aspects, and we, uh, if you're in one of those businesses, part of my business is pretty commoditized. There's areas to expand the business, expand the portfolio. You need an awful lot of support around you. The challenge that I put out there is, if you're in that kind of a business and you want to get much more ingratiated and ingrained in the engagement with your customers, you need to think about maybe going to another business. And I'll say it first up, if my company had stayed the Dell it was for the first 20 years of its existence, I would not be at my company. Over the last three years, we've acquired $13 billion of intellectual property. And frankly, the, the core of the business, which initially funded the huge growth and success, is now something that we engage with customers in a very low value add model, online, through chat, through other medians. And so as you think about it though, or, or as you think about your engagement in the sales process and what type of business you're in and what you're thinking about for your career, there's a piece there of, hey, how can, how can I have an incredibly exciting, rich, enriched life? And that is to get into a position where you're not just trading on emotional capital, on emotional IQ, but you're bringing in the intellect the cognitive abilities of truly, truly understanding the complexities of your customer and merging your portfolio against it. And uh, the numbers are that 17% of people in this room have that ability out, off the gates, 17%. So it's an interesting one. I think the market's going there. It's going there rapidly. But what kind of a salesperson are you going to be and what does your career like, look like 10 years down the road? So you're saying only 17% of this room has the skills required to do that? No. Seven, I, I have a fundamental optimistic belief that everybody <laughs> has intelligence and the ability to be successful. I was going to say, what the hell What I am do? saying is that through uh, various studies in the marketplace, approximately 17% of current sellers are truly using the total scope of their cognitive, intellectual, business acumen abilities plus all of the groundwork that is required to be a truly excellent professional salesperson. Right. I think I heard yeah. what Kevin say is that if you're in the commodity business and you're selling, you might be in the wrong line of business. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, having agree. said that, you know, I have a uh, hoster in Montreal that started a business on a commodity and uh, built the hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue uh, without any sales feet in the streets. And so I encourage all of you to be creative and thinking about what the next wave of innovation is in our business. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal that we're seeing businesses start up today with very few feet in the streets. Um, as that business has evolved, there will be more feet in the streets going after some of the bigger customers across the country of Canada. Um, but we absolutely have an opportunity to innovate around the commodity business and how we take it to market. Yeah. Now, now, Christy, because you guys are relatively new, you're relatively new. Are you? Uh Whereas, whereas Kevin and Dennis have, you know, legacy sales teams to kind of retrain and evolve and innovate and everything. So are you recruiting a different type of salesperson than these guys? Do you think? I'm recruiting the same kind of person I've always recruited. And by the way, I am recruiting right now. Um, <laughs> but, but that person is, I think that person is very different. The kind of person I've always recruited is different from the kind of salesperson that 
that you might stereotypically think about. And, and you know, I'd echo what, what Kevin says. This person, they need to be smart. They need to be able to think really quickly, change directions really quickly, and really apply what it is that they're learning to what tools are in their toolkit super fast. Like that, that is the real, true sales in its most essential form is really creative. It's about like listening, in, ingesting the information, meshing it with what you've got and then being able to turn that around and, 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 and talk to the, to the solution, to the answer, um, to the path to success and, and, and merging that with the personality of the person that you're talking to to try to find what's going to be most relevant to them. And, and that all has to happen really, really fast. And I think to pull that off, like, you know, you, you, have, to be really, you have to be really quick and you have to be really bright. Um, and you can practice a lot and practice sure does help. Yeah. But you know, essentially, you also have to be able to move fast, respond quickly, and, and be really smart about it. I, I think there's a piece here of reactivity, proactivity. Uh, what Chrissy's talking about, uh, in my mind, is the individuals, when they accomplish their objective, you kind of go, wow, how did they do that? Because it is such an eclectic mix of skills, experience brought to the table, that allows you to truly, that allows them to truly break through those barriers and do things which others and their colleagues maybe aren't doing. And that's what I think we're all looking for. And uh, since you put a pitch, if somebody out there in the audience is of that mindset, then please contact me. I'm on LinkedIn, Kevin underscore Peace. <laughs> <laughs> This is, Dennis, this is, no, no, this is a recruiting it. session. You know, from, from a Microsoft question. perspective, from a Dell perspective, from Christie's company, we need great people. We're in the people business. Hey, what, you're just leaving me out in the cold here? The tight group is hiring too, yeah. <laughs> and we'll pay double than what they're going to pay you. <laughs> maybe, move, wars, maybe, I like it. maybe to move this along, uh, I had an all-hands call across the country of Canada on last Friday, and there were a couple of quotes that I think stuck with the team. And uh, one, by show of hands, who likes to deal with ambiguity in the room? <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe not. Yeah. yeah, not many. Live for it. But it's a competency we must have as we evolve in the life cycle of our sales process. But there are a couple of quotes that I shared with the team. And one is, if you're comfortable, then you're not moving fast enough. Yep. So really think through that. Um, the evolution of our industry in sales today is moving very, very fast in I think we all need to push ourselves out of our comfort zone a bit to move with it. Um, and at the end of the day, old world thinking will not break through in the new world. Yeah. Let me, so, so I'll get brief sometimes to address a group of people, and here's the way it typically goes, right? If it's a finance group, they'll say, you know, show some graphs, they'll be happy. Uh, if it's a marketing group, they'll say, eh, tell some jokes, they're just happy to be out of the office, it'll, it'll be great. <laughs> But when it's a sales-focused group, and I'm being completely honest with this, when it's a sales-focused group, nine times out of 10, it's, you gotta watch it, because these guys, and I mean guys in the gender-specific way because of how dominated it is by males, are not open to change, they do not want to innovate, and they're not gonna buy what you're selling until you get them on side. And, and the term, you know, kind of wrangling the cowboys it, it, it has been used. So, I don't know, how do you motivate that group of people? Because I think I agree with what you're saying, but how do you motivate somebody who's been doing something the same way for so many years and sometimes commission-based going, I know what's right and I put the money in my pocket. How do you motivate them to, to, to do something new, to try something new? I think that's a leadership responsibility, but it starts with one of my favorite books, Who Moved Your Cheese? Yeah. And it's all about moving fast and finding your spot. Um, but I think we have an ob obligation to our teams to, one, lead by example, uh, two, make sure that we've got the right competency and experience within our teams. Are we driving diversity and inclusion, which drives innovation? Um, are we surrounding our teams um, with the right inspiration, challenges, and rewards um, so that they'll feel like you know, every day is a new day and they've got an opportunity to go out and make it um, and to really break through? And at the end of the day, our mission is really about you know, making an impact on the world um, and so I like to um, lead with inspiration and make sure that we got the right people on board. Um, I love Gallup Strengths Finder. Yeah. Uh, when you're looking to evolve your teams over time, there's nothing like looking at the top five strengths of your team that you have existing in the uh, population today, but also looking at how you complement the strengths of your team moving forward. 
Um, so I think it's an obligation we have as leaders. So, Christy, I, I was going to say, yeah, is, I, it, is it an old white dude problem? Like, do we need more women in sales? I'm serious. Do we need more women in sales? I love hiring women in sales. I think women listen better. I think they can be more compassionate. Yeah. I think... I, 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 Definitely <laughs> exceed on the intellect as well, right, Christy? Well, and yeah, they're, they're smart and they're not hung up on ego in the same way. Yep. So, I Seriously. mean... I agree with you. I 100% agree with you. So, I mean, what I was going to say to the to the cowboy problem, I'd say just show them how it's done. Bring somebody else in and show them success. And then they either they either innovate or die. Well, yeah. not literally, but... I, yeah, I, I agree with both my colleagues, but I'm taking offense to this whole discussion because <laughs> I, I grew up in a place called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, close to Alberta. And hey, what's wrong with a bit of pair of cowboy boots? And no, <laughs> from from a sales perspective, we need cowboys. Yep. And so the essence here is, you need somebody who will get on that horse, no matter how ferocious it is. Get bucked off, get back on, do it again until they break it down. Now, will they have all the finer points that we're after here? I think it comes down to leadership. It comes down to having the right mix of talent. But fundamentally, you can surround those individuals who will break through doors with others who will help get you to that next place. Yep. And so that's the mix. Uh, Dennis talked about the leadership component in the team. That's the mix of bringing the human assets together. Now, fundamentally, I agree with Christy as well. If someone goes to the position and you lead them to the proverbial trough of water and they're dying in the desert because they don't want to drink, after a while, you got to shoot that horse. Right. <laughs> you know, though, I, I, would, I would agree with what you're saying. Sometimes the answer is to pair people up. And if you can find, if you've got somebody who can be really, really strong in one area and they're never going to be able yeah. to do the rest of it, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You just find them a partner who can take care of the rest of it and they can be, they can be a team. Yeah. Um, has... Uh, and I feel like this is a question that gets asked at, uh, on every business panel, but I'm going to ask it. Has social media changed your insert job description here? Has social media changed the sales process at all, Dennis? Social media hasn't changed the nature of the sales process. It's absolutely added some new dynamics to our world. Uh, as an example, you can be linked in today and, and get insight into a customer and or a business scenario um, but it still hasn't changed the fundamental relationship capital need and the desire to get in and make a difference inside of that environment. Uh, it, does it help us to put out feeds into the social waves to understand where our customers are going? Absolutely. I've gotten ahead of sales cycles and competitive cycles by just listening to the social waves of where developers are blogging or where customers are making their big bet um, or where they're going to their quarterly earnings calls. Um, I think we can get a lot more insightful, but at the end of the day, it hasn't changed the fundamental blocking and tackling that one has to execute on. Christy, because of your, uh, how relatively new you guys are, are you using it in, in a unique way? Oh, huge. We're using, I, think social, I think social has changed the way that you can connect with people, the way you can warm up a cold call um, in, in many, many ways. But it's, have you seen the Modern Family episode where they're selling a house, they find a buyer, and they research the buyer on Facebook, and they find out everything about the buyer, and then they customize the house so that it's the perfect house for the guy. And he comes in, and he's utterly charmed right up until the moment that he realizes they have been creeping him. Right. And then he's gone so fast. And, I, and I, think, I think you do have to be really, really careful and use social media judiciously. If you can use it to find a warm introduction, if you can use it to uh, learn a little bit about the person, that's great. But if you start you know, checking out photos of their family and making comments about them, that, that might take you too far. So you know, balance that and, yeah. and keep an eye on it. Yeah. Sure, you all watch Modern Family, but you don't watch the Grammys, liars, all of you. Um, <laughs> can I grab that and then sure. you can share with those? No. So I'm going to come into the audience, um, and it's, it's really tough in this room, so I will do my best to come up the aisle. Uh, we have a, just a few minutes to take your questions. Um, in the front middle. This is my... Front middle. Oh, there we go. This is my Phil Donahue. Hi, um, my name is Christopher Bathgate. I, um, I go to University of Toronto for Computer Science, and right now we're trying to start do this startup that's kind of innovated, and um, this is a question for Dennis. Um, 
we're, we're trying to change the paradigm, and I know your company right now is sort of, they have the Xbox with their Kinect, and they have Windows 8, which kind of changes the desktop. And I, Microsoft has been struggling to sort of like compare to Windows 7, their sales with that kind of thing. Um, how do you sell a new technology that kind of changes sort of how users perceive like computing and that kind of stuff. How do you sell them something completely new that kind of changes how they interact with technology and sort of something that is really hard to sell? Did I hear you love, that you love Windows 8? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what you heard is that he's a student from U of T somehow sitting in the platinum seats. That's I what I want to know. Platinum seats. <laughs> how the hell did you get that seat? Your dad? Yeah, all right. That's a, that's a great question. Um, Look, at, at Microsoft, we're going through a very transformational, game-changing time right now of being a devices and services company. And so that means we have to reflect on where we're at. Um, are we set up for success? Do we have the right people? Do we have the right horsepower um, in our partner ecosystem and the way that we go to market to transition our company? And so there's readiness. Um, there's certainly a customer equation, a partner equation that we have to have really tight there in the way that we go to market, position our products, and the like. Um, but we are absolutely internally going through um, a sifting process, if you will, of who's on and who's off the bus and what it takes to first focus on the people to make the change. And that, I'll go back to that statement around the uncomfortable nature to make change in the world today. And I tell you that uh, we're pushing really, really, really hard. Um, that does take some technical readiness. Um, that does take a set of customers that are willing to um, let, jump in with us and find ways to innovate in their business, drive bottom line revenue, um, top line revenue and the like. Um, but it's those beachhead, beachhead wins that we're out there after. I'll give you an example. I was working with a customer the other day, Genetech, and we have this new solution called Azure in the marketplace. Think about it as platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. And Genetech's a security surveillance company that's doing B2B work today. Um, they're interested in a B2C business. Um, they were interested in Azure and how they might spin up a line of business without a lot of uh, venture capitalist investments. And so innovating and finding a company that wants to go grow their revenue and leveraging technology and finding that way to tell the story and replicate it is where we're at. Um, absolutely a transformational phase right now. Find me afterwards. I'm interested to know what you're up to and how we can help you. Hey, uh, just a quick one for me. So I think I've been doing this as long as you've been alive, young men. So the, don't take it as advice. I don't want to go there. But just from a consult standpoint, I think I've seen this many times. We deal with hundreds of thousands of small businesses across the country. My, my words to you would be determine very quickly in the process if the individual you're speaking with has an appetite for change, has an appetite to really undertake something new, trend setting, etc. Because, and figure that out, find a way. It, it happens through all kinds of techniques, etc., and questioning, etc. But when you get there and you know that that person is willing to sponsor the change, engage in the change, be there with you, then you, it's time for you, you to invest your precious resources. If they're not, at one stage, you cut loose and you go on to the next. Because your time is precious, you've got a business to start, to run, to grow. You've got to do it aggressively. You've got to make sure you're there with people who are going to be there with you. We have a, we have a question up here. Yeah, hi, my name is Labe, and over here, you can't see, you're blinded by the light. No, way back here, look to your, there you go. Hey, hey, Wade. How you doing? Good. Thanks for a great uh, talk today. I wanted to know, I'm a part-time student at the Schulich School of Business in the MBA program, and for the life of mine, I've been trying to find more courses at that level on sales, and there's one course that's offered one semester, that's it, I've taken all the marketing stuff. And I'm just trying to figure out what is it about sales that, in a sense, I don't feel it has that academic feel to it. And I've taken a lot of sales courses outside, and that's why I'm here today. But I'm just not getting the sales training. And I want to feel, uh, hear what you have to say about that. Um, I, I, think, I think sales needs to be learned by doing. Um, and I think the best thing you could do would be to find yourself something to sell that you could be successful at. I think you need to throw yourself into it so that you can learn um, how it feels, what the sales cycle feels like, um, what, it's, what it feels like to make the, make the close. And, and in my experience, um, I, I have a drama degree. 
Uh, I never took any sales training at all, and it wasn't until I started doing it um, that, that I learned what I was good at, what I wasn't good at, and what I, needed to, uh, what I needed to improve. So my advice to you would be don't try to learn it in a book, um, but get out there and try to do it. Yeah, hey, uh, I play hockey in the Adult Safe Hockey League, which is non-contact. <laughs> we only have one fight per game on average, so it's great. Sales is a contact sport. With that said, my wife, I think she pitched up today because we, we got a ticket for her, is doing a PhD in sales and sales leadership. There is a body of work out there that if you do the research, you will find. I do think there's core components around understanding the process itself. To Christie's point though, you can understand all the theory you want. Nothing happens until you are in front of a customer and you're making it happen for that customer. And we're uh, back here hoping you have a job, ma'am, uh, for this question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, guys. Barb Lebo from Toronto. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I have my own business for the last 25 years. You know what really pisses me off? <laughs> Tell us. When I did my MBA at York, they didn't have any sales courses either, by the way, but on the one hand, there's so many ways to track people down and find out who you are and where you are and what you're all about. And on the other side of the equation, what is the deal? It's like you're the brand manager of shoelaces and you won't give out your extension. They won't give out the email. It's like, what, what are we, manufacturing plutonium or something? It's like some big secret. I've got an important service. I want to be able to reach who I'm supposed to be talking to. And companies, never mind if you can't even get through to talk to somebody, but trying to go through the maze if you don't, you know what I'm saying? Spelling their name and getting through. What is going on with all of the secrecy and privacy and not letting us through? Anybody else upset with the same thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it's I, b I believe Rick Mercer is. You can hear that rant tonight <laughs> on the CBC. <laughs> yeah, that, that is super frustrating. There's no question at all. Uh, you know, I, I think it comes down to how much choice is out there, how many people are trying to get in front of the brand manager's shoelaces, and and, and how little time they have and how much pressure is being put on them to accomplish so many other tasks. And, and this is why you, you need to find some way to show them quickly what the value is that you're going to add to their life. And, and maybe that's making them a hero, maybe that's uh, moving their sales of shoelaces, doubling it in a year, whatever it is, you need to find a way to get that to them succinctly, and maybe it's through another person, a warm introduction. Maybe you have to stalk them at the shoelace convention that you can, uh, you know, buy a ticket for. Uh, or maybe you just need like a, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a case of persistently um, staying in contact with them and delivering them interesting tidbits as you go along. But it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Hey, just, just a quick one-liner, then I'll pass it to Dennis, is my, if you, uh, if you were to see my inbox at work, Last quarter, I've got 21,000 unread emails. And it's amazing how many people will contact you once or twice and then stop. I don't even bother. If you don't have that sense of, uh, Christy mentioned it, persistence, if you're not there six times, eight times, if it's truly valuable and you can add value to me, you're going to hang in the process. Yeah, I'll just add, to, we were closing down this last uh, discussion on sales and readiness and the like. Probably applies to this question. There is an art and there is a science. Get creative in balancing the two. Very nice. Uh, we have one final question. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Tyler McConville. I work for a marketing agency downtown Toronto, actually newly founded, called Ninth Co. I have a question about sales and tools you use. As far as analytics and more technical SEO, digital media, do you find that influences your sales positively over the last five years? I'll start there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, big data is one of our core four strategies at Microsoft today. Uh, but getting outside of just the core intelligence that we have in our systems today that allow for us to target, hunt, and win, um, we're getting into predictive analysis. So think 
PhD in mathematics and science to where we can actually start predicting moving forward with data the decision that will be made before it's even made. Um, I was talking to one of our uh, PhD mathematicians last week and he was telling me a story about propensity and how customers will buy based on propensity and how this predictive analysis that we're doing is starting to tell us where the customer is at, where the buying trends are at, where the industries are at before we even get to the discussion in the boardroom. And so it's absolutely a big bet. We got to solve for it. We have to solve for it for world hunger, for health around the world, um, not just our customer sales cycles. Yeah, it's all about the law of precious resources and the analytic component, whether it's through social media, of understanding very quickly, we do it through a global command center, very quickly where issues are arising or trends are arising so that we can adapt and respond through to the allocation of precious sales resources to those customers, as Dennis mentioned, have the highest propensity, the highest likelihood of being those customers that we'll have a long-term relationship with. So the data is absolutely critical. Remember though, at the end, we need people that are in this room to make it happen. And that's the critical factor of marrying and merging the data, the analytics, the business insights with those individuals who can get it done. Uh, we'll finish up with uh, 30 seconds. Christy, starting with you. Um, over the next year, I'm in sales. What's the one strength, one skill set I should really focus on, on strengthening? Figure out what you can do better than anybody else. What is your superpower that you can bring to every interaction that is going to set you apart from anyone else that that buyer is going to meet this year? And if you can figure that out and then figure out how to make that useful to that buyer, then they will always call you no matter where you work. Dennis, how about you? Drive social capital. Those that are socially connected are more productive, more wallet share, more mind share, and that's where it's at. Great. Um, Kevin? Yeah, this one is pretty basic, but it's not. Truly, truly understand your customer to a depth that will allow you to not just sell one line of business, but two and three. And uh, internally in our company, if we engage with a customer, each line of business increases the overall profit from that customer by 15 to 20%. So the deeper you get in understanding your customer, providing value, building that trust, that relationship, and moving forward, the more successful inherently you'll be. But it begins with the customer. That's great. Thanks to each, and, uh, each of you for those uh, wonderful interviews. You are so much fun. Oh, well, thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks to our panel. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.